California Congressman Adam Schiff, a Democrat, has proposed a bill called the Equal Access to Reproductive Care Act. His bill would make reproductive costs such as IVF, surrogacy, and sperm egg donation automatically tax deductible. Many states already allow tax deductions of this kind, but only after a demonstrated period of infertility. Why is this not enough? Joining me now to discuss the bill is Katie, Fa Katie Faust, founder and director of Them Before Us. Katie, good to see you today. Thanks for having me on, Joseph. Now, you've written a, 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 a bill, not a bill, you've written an article critical of this legislation, uh, but we're a pro-family organization. We like children. Shouldn't we be excited about legislation that encourages people to have kids? We do love children. We love babies, but we don't like commodifying babies. And we don't like violating the natural rights of babies. We already know that children have a right to life. And we have built 50 years of campaigns against the violation of this fundamental child right. But we also believe that children have a right to their mother and father. And that is what this bill is going to seek to do, is violate that fundamental child right. Um, it's really not the Equal Access to Reproductive Care Act. It really is the subsidizing intentional motherless and fatherless act. And it needs to be opposed. And Katie, tell us a bit more about how it does that. Why does this bill separate kids from their parents? Yeah. So what they're doing is they're redefining the term infertility. Previously, if you were deemed infertile, then you could get these tax deductions um, for medical care and reproductive services. Um, but usually that meant a heterosexual couple who was having unprotected sex for 12 months. And so presumably, even if you were using these services, um, you were the child was still going home with their mother or father, or at least a mother and father. But that definition of infertility was deemed insufficiently inclusive because it excludes people who are not able to be deemed infertile in the traditional sense. And so they are redefining infertility because the reality is that many of these same sex couples or single adults, single men and single women who are going to seek these services are totally fertile, but their relationship status is not. And so in the name of equality and inclusivity, we are redefining infertility so that single men, single women, and same-sex couples can have these subsidized services. And of course, all of these children are going to go home with adults where there is going to be either a mother or a father missing from their home. And Katie, this is where we get this concept of gay infertility, which many people probably haven't heard of, but it's being introduced like so many new terms are. And this idea of gay infertility is, well, we have to t treat those who are gay infertile the same as those who are heterosexually infertile, but that will uh, quickly become ridiculous to those who think about that because, of course, the nature of the relationship is inherently infertile. But Katie, you and them before us, you work on this idea that the rights of children should be put before the rights of the adults. And of course, the desire for children is natural and it's healthy, in fact. But in your work, why do you think it's not preferable for children to be introduced into situations where they will, by definition, uh, mi be missing either their mother or their father, or perhaps both? Well, first of all, because children have a right to be known and loved by their mother and father. Um, and when they're denied that right, they are often put in households that are more stable and uh, unstable and more risky. Um, second, because when we honor that fundamental child right, when a child goes home with both their mother and father from the hospital, they are guaranteed to have the maternal and paternal love that maximizes child development. And finally, when a child's right to their mother and father is honored, that means they also get access to something that children crave, and that is their genetic identity, their biological identity. And we know that children conceived through third-party reproductive technologies overwhelmingly agree that this donor that contributed half of their genetics is actually their biological parent, their own father or their own mother. And it's a relationship that these children crave. They long to know the person that gave them life. And so these technologies, and certainly the government subsidizing these technologies is harming children on every level that you can harm them in terms of their uh, 
family stability, in terms of their developmental um, capacity, and in terms of their own identity development. So these are not things that anybody should be encouraging, and it's certainly not something the government should be subsidizing. And Katie, we only have about a minute left. I know you actually speak to a lot of these now adults who were who came into the world through reproductive technology. What do they tell you about the impact this has on kids? Yeah, genealogical bewilderment, right? The idea of like, I don't know who I am because I don't know from whom I came. Feelings of commodification. Almost half of them are disturbed that their conception was a financial transaction. Longing to know their missing parent, longing to know their dozens or maybe hundreds of half siblings out in the world, and also feelings of being designed, purchased, that eugenics played a role in this. So regardless of who is using these technologies, single, married, gay, or straight, these are child harming technologies that need to be rejected. And to that point, and, and your organization is appropriately named Them Before Us, the, the big E on the eye chart here is adults have to put the needs of the children in front of us as the adults. And if we don't, bad things happen. Katie Faust, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.